We, no, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Peter Paul Hecking. Um, as, I, as, I just, as I mentioned, towering personality in every respect, wonderful sense of humor. We are delighted he is with us. Great scientist. He was recommended, he, he trained with our previous speaker, Hans Inthween, but the connection goes back. Hans was trained by Peter Sturck. Both uh, Hans and this Peter trained with uh, Peter Sturck and Elizabeth Bell. So the, we, this is a whole family of um, um, Dutch scientists who have uh, got a connection with the Firestone. So brief uh, background about Peter. Peter uh, did his undergrad uh, training in Rotterdam, then did his med school in Pronigen. Again, we have got a connection. We have had Professor Dirk Postma and uh, uh, Hugh Kirsten visit us a number of times. Uh, Hugh trained here with Paula Byrne for a couple of years. Then he did his med, uh, his training, his PhD with Peter Sturck in, in, Amsterdam. in Amsterdam. And now he's working and training in clinical medicine, finishing his pulmonary training last year of pulmonary training in Rotterdam with Dr. Intveen. So last year's career done a lot of work in uh, using the u uh, data set, which is going to talk to us of uh, integrating omics data and analyzing it and uh, implementing it in clinical care. So it's an absolute pleasure that he is with us. He was sent to us for three months of uh, clinical placement. We hope he, we, you know, we, Delighted to have him here. All our colleagues in the lab enjoy working with him. He's involved in a number of projects and he's going to share with us his data uh, in you Biopred. Exactly. Thanks very much again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for these very kind of words. So, um, the problem is we don't have it. We have never had such a tall speaker. Yeah, so the camera a is a bit the camera hard Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I almost can skip my first slides. Let me see if it works. Because I, I start as well, because not everyone knows me here. So who am I? Um, this is me. And I am from the Netherlands. And as you can see here, you've seen the map before. This is the Netherlands. I was born and raised in Rotterdam, um, which is a beautiful modern city. Then I studied in Groningen, just like Dr. Nier told, uh, told me. I did my medical school there. I went to Amsterdam to the AMC, which is currently called the Amsterdam UMC which I did my uh, PhD training with Peter Sturck and Elizabeth Bell. And now I'm back in Rotterdam, luckily, on the Franciscus Gasthuis, and I'm um, finishing my clinical training to become a gastrobiologist. Um, it is good to know this is the Netherlands. And if you compare it to the map of Canada, I put the Netherlands in there, you wouldn't see, but it is down here. Uh, our country fits in Lake Huron. So that's important to know. So the next question that Dr. Nier talked about as well is, why am I here? Is it just because of Lake Huron, you would say? Not entirely, but partly it's true because me and my family had a wonderful week on the new lake. Um, but more important, I did my PhD thesis together. This is when I defended it together with Peter Sturck, who is here, and Elizabeth Bell. You can see Anneke Tim Brink, who does uh, work on well, uh, lots of work uh, uh, as well. And I, def I defended my thesis entitled Severe Asthma from Burden to Biology, and which was mentioned before as well. Hans in who was just sitting here in front of us here, did his PhD with Peter Sturg and Elizabeth Bell as well, but only 18 years before, I think. Something like this. Yeah, even more. Even more. <laughs> Six years before. Yeah. Also. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about the work I did during my thesis. Uh, and my thesis consisted of three important chapters, it was about epidemiology, about mechanisms, and I talk a really, really short about a registry, which I put uh, time in as well during the time I was doing my research. And it's important to have some context because currently we live in 2022 and severe asthma has changed a lot the past decades. Um, and until 2010, but you could even say until 2015, this is how the GINA guideline of the treatment of severe asthma looked like. So here are the, the mild patients who have occasional symptoms and the severe chronic asthma, and you um, increase the dose of inhaled steroids, uh, you add uh, a leukotriene antagonist or theophylline, uh, you add oral steroids or even steroid sparing drugs, which was omeluzumab mostly in that time. And all these patients were, uh, were called difficult to control asthma. So the patients with uncontrolled disease, they were on the right side of this 
uh, of this uh, uh, figure. In 2011, uh, Hans shortly uh, mentioned it as well, uh, Elizabeth Bell published a paper to, distinct, to distinguish between difficult to control asthma and severe asthma, because severe asthma are the patients that may um, have an indication for the novel biologic treatments. And what she did, she made a flow diagram, you can see it here, but mainly what it says, the first question, if you have a patient with uncontrolled disease, uncontrolled asthma, does the patient have asthma? Is the diagnosis correct? If so, and that's why all the e-health um, study is done as well, is the inhalation technique correct? It is very important. I'm so sorry to interrupt for a second. I'm getting messages that there's some problem. The slides are not projecting okay. and moving. Okay, I know what's wrong. So we need to... New share, then we yeah. do this one. I think it's... Um, can you ask if it works now? Huh? Can you just put in the chat and see if it's working? Can you just move up and down and see the slides right. are not moving? Just ask the audience, and perhaps. Does it work? Could someone in the chat tell me if they see the slides now? No. Yes, yes we're working. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, you just missed some pictures about Canada. So the most important data will still come. Um, so the first question, does your patient with uncontrolled disease have asthma or is there something else? Is inhalation technique correct? Is the compliance of the uh, using the medication correct? Is there any remaining exposition to allergens or other um, expositions on work or other things that can aggravate the, the, uh, the disease? Or are there important comorbidities which are untreated and can cause, uh, cause uncontrolled disease? So in my thesis, I make my own figure to try to uh, understand what is the difference. And I think it is like this. So you have difficult to control asthma. These are all patients within the blue figure. Um, let me check if it works. To be sure, I think it's working. It's working. Yeah. Seems to work now. Perfect. So in the blue figure, we have all patients with difficult to control asthma, and all these patients may be uncontrolled due to the things we just mentioned: comorbidities, uh, ex exposures to sensitizing agents, incorrect inhalation techniques. And a small part of these patients have true severe asthma. The patients we see in the clinics here. And these patients have uncontrolled disease to, due to intrinsic mechanisms, different mechanisms as we know now, that cause their disease to be uncontrolled. So it is very important for all the patients you see with, severe, with uncontrolled asthma to address all these things over and over every time you see them. Um, from many more time, we know that the uh, asthma is a very heterogeneous disease. This is just one of the figures I could have shown. The study uh, done by Haldar in 2018, in 2008 it was published, but it's just uh, to show that asthma is not just, not just one disease, but very heterogeneous. There's many different pheno and endotypes. For example, in this cluster analysis, which shows uh, different uh, phenotypes, some patients have high symptom burden and low airway inflammation, low eosinophilic airway inflammation. Other patients have very high eosinophilic inflammation without any symptoms or with many symptoms. So, uh, and this, these are just a few of the um, important uh, issues in severe asthma. Based on literature, literature review, we try to give it a name. Um, and we made, we made this figure and this is just theoretically, but it is good to know to realize asthma is not asthma or it is asthma, but it is, there's more than just asthma. In this figure, we show that on the right, on the left side, you see childhood onset asthma, on the right side, adult onset asthma, non eosinophilic asthma and eosinophilic asthma. These are the, the well, main, some of the main phenotypical features of the patients. But even within these, there's patients with have occupational asthma. We have elite athletes uh, which have uh, asthma, patients with many exacerbations which sometimes is called exacerbation prone asthma, um, acid, aspirin exacerbated asthma, occupational asthma, uh, which is either eosinophilic or non-eosinophilic, uh, asthma related to infection, cigarette smoke uh, asthma. And this is, well, theoretically, so this isn't perfectly how it is, but it is important to understand if you see a patient, there's many more than just, uh, there can be many more um, um, uh, features that characterize their disease than just the obstruction. So what were the aims of my thesis? 
What is the prevalence? I shortly talk about this. What is the role of comorbidities in uncontrolled disease? I shortly talk about this as well. And then I go a little deeper into the mechanisms with, uh, we've, we've, um, uh, we've done with, within the UBIOPED studies. And how I did this. So this is the figure I just showed you. In red, we can, in blue, let's see if we can remove this. Well, it says that uh, with literature and pharmacy database study, we try to assess the prevalence and the comorbidities. And with UBIOPRED, we try to assess the real mechanisms in patients that remain severe, that remain uncontrolled. So why is it important, the prevalence, or what is the prevalence? Most papers still say that 5 to 10% of patients with uh, asthma, adult patients with asthma, have severe asthma. Mostly there, there's no reference to this figure or they use the ERS ATS guidelines of 2014, uh, published uh, of the first author was uh, Fen Chong from London. And what he says in this paper is that, uh, however, figures of five to two percent of the total asthma population are often estimated. Uh, little is understood regarding the prevalence. Other, other papers refer to Peter Barnes paper in 1998 and they say that uh, most patients with asthma are easily diagnosed and respond to standard treatment with a short-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist for symptom control and long-term treatment. Uh, doses up to 2,000 micrograms of inhaled corticosteroids, approximately 5% of patients do not respond to this. With the information we had uh, with the paper from Elizabeth Bell, we tried to assess the real prevalence of severe asthma. And how did we do it? We had a pharmacy database um, the highest, I'm not sure how I can get this away. Maybe I can put it somewhere else. No, it, it, here it says the number 500,000, so half a million. So we had a pharmacy database representing half a million Dutch patients. And we uh, collected patients from this database with a prescription for high intensity treatment, which means medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroids or the use of oral corticosteroids. We sent questionnaires to 5,000 of these patients. And we analyzed half of them. So these questionnaires were sent anonymized and even half of them were responded, which is, we're quite happy with that. This question, uh, these questionnaires included questions on their diagnosis, on their smoking history, on their asthma control, so ACQ, um, on their comorbidities like allergies, nasal polyps. And um, from that, we, uh, we defined patients who had asthma, diagnosed of asthma or COPD without a smoking history. Um, that had a, a, a prescription in this database for high intensity treatment. Patients were uh, defined or difficult to control if they had this treatment and were on control based on the ACQ higher than 1.5, um, had more than three exacerbations in the previous year, had one or more hospitalizations or ICU um, uh, admitting, or they needed OCS to be well controlled, they needed prednisone. In a subselection of these patients, we looked at their looked at their inhalation technique and to their compliance, which we knew from this database. And we said if these patients were uncontrolled, they had a good adherence to their medication, so they collected 80% of their prescription, and they had a correct in, uh, inhalation technique. They were called severe asthma. So we tried to assess most of the other confounding factors. And if we um, put these numbers, if we me, uh, mirror them to our Dutch population. We, at that moment, had a, a little bit less than 70 million people, uh, 12 million adults, 370,000 patients with asthma. And we said 17.4% of them is difficult to control, and only 3.6% of them is uh, real severe asthma. So the 5 to 10%, I think, is fine. Um, we did a very liberal, the reviewers asked to do, asked us to do very liberal um, uh, calculation as well without, with a very low uh, a, a collection of the medication and then still it is only 4.5%. So I think the message is only a very small percentage of all patients with severe as of asthma really have uncontrolled, have, really have severe asthma. And these are the patients we see in clinic and we see in our clinics as well. Um, and these numbers were even taken because they're sometimes criticized, even taken by the new GINA guidelines. So people believe in them. But the, mo the most important question is why is severe asthma important? Well, as many um, 
as many uh, studies have shown, and this is just one of them, is that the majority of asthma costs is due just to the small amount of patients that have severe asthma. This is an, uh, 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 this was shown in the GINA guidelines, but uh, Nunes is all and others showed it as well, that patients with severe persistent asthma had, uh, uh, were responsible for the, for the majority of the costs. So it is no to know who these people are and it's no to treat them in order to get the cost down and the burden of disease. We know these patients have more uh, comorbidities. In red, the patients with difficult to control asthma. In white, the patients with not with difficult to control asthma. And we saw they had more obesity, anxiety, depression was more prevalent, cardiovascular disease, and even um, um, uh, gastro uh, reflex disease was uh, more prevalent in these groups. So it is important to look at this as well when you see patients. And we saw a recent published uh, uh, paper by uh, our colleague, Katrin Eger. These are all patients who are on OCS. So patients you see in your clinic who have severe asthma using prednisone. 30% of them uh, were adherent, but had a poor inhalation te technique. And almost half of them were non-adherent to the medication. So this would conclude that only uh, a little bit more than 20% of the patients on OCS would um, have an indication for a biologic treatment. So it is important to know there's more than just um, there's more than just the biomarkers, but look at the whole patient. So these were the studies we did on prevalence and comorbidities. Uh, and I'll now tell you a little bit more about our UBioPRED studies, about more about the mechanistic work. UBioPRED is a large European study, which were included 20 centers from 12 different countries. Many pharmaceutical companies were included as well. And it stands for unbiased biomarkers in the prediction for respiratory disease outcomes. And the aim was to um, configure the handprint of the severe asthma patient. And the handprint consists of different fingerprints. Fingerprints being the different omics, breath omics, transcriptomics, um, metabolomics, also the questionnaire, so demographic, uh, demographic uh, information, uh, ACQ, AQ, OQ. Um, and they try to, to, we try to define the handprint and the fingerprint of the different patients. We included 525 patients with severe asthma, 100 and a mild asthma, 100 healthy controls. They were included, we included children as well, but I won't talk about that uh, today. Uh, we saw them at baseline. Um, and on the next slide, I'll show you what we've uh, collected from all of these patients. So we did a clinical assessment, so all demographic data, exacerbation data, uh, many questionnaires. And for the omics, we collected nasal blushings, breath omics, of uh, uh, nasal blushings. We collected breath for the enos and the GCMS, so breath omics. We collected sputum, which we did lipidomics, proteomics, and transcriptomics on. We collected in some patients uh, bronchial biopsies and bronchial uh, brushings. We collected blood and we collected urine. And the first uh, uh, overview paper was published in 2015 in the ERJ. And this is just show what uh, patients in this cohort looked like. So there were 308 severe non-smoking patients, severe asthma non-smoking patients, 110 severe asthma patients with were smoking and ex-smokers, more than 10 pack years, uh, moderate asthma patients and the 100 healthy controls. They were all significantly different over the groups, which doesn't surprise us at all, obviously. Um, and we saw that the patients with severe asthma had higher eosinophils in the sputum as compared to the moderate uh, patients. Their pheno was quite comparable. And we saw more nasal polyps in patients with, which had severe asthma as compared to moderate asthma. So I'd like to discuss two studies with you. Uh, the first is the uh, the transcriptomic analysis on patients, severe asthma patients with persistent airflow limitation. So these are the patients we see in clinics as well, which are the patients which remain to have obstruction despite um, optimal treatment in our, uh, which we can give currently. We know that it is present in a substantial proportion of severe asthma patients, and we know it's in about half of the patients in the UBiopet cohort. We know that if patients have persistent airway limitation, it is associated with a higher number of extra sedation. 
increased mortality and the eosinophilic airway inflammation is more often in, uh, uh, is more often present in these patients. But at that moment, it is 2017, we're five years further, and I've learned a lot these last two months about uh, persistent airway limitation or persistent obstruction in my patients. Uh, we really didn't um, understand the underlying mechanism. So we defined a persistent post bronchodilator, a persistent airflow limitation by a post bronchodilator FEV1 FEC ratio lower than the of a lower than the lower limit of normal. Um, this was the formula which we used, which was published by Kanya, which was the PhD supervisor of Peter Sturck, which is quite interesting to tell. Um, and for the mic, for the transcriptomics, we use uh, this platform. Uh, Johnson um, uh, Johnson Johnson did a, the analysis for us, who were were a partner in a new biofed um, study. Um, so we had the transcriptomics of nasal brushings in sputum, in bronchial biopsies, and in bronchial brushings. There was no complete overlap between the samples, which is the biggest flaw of UBiopred and I think this analysis. So we did have sputum in 64 patients, but we didn't have for all the 64 patients also the brushings, the biopsies, um, um, or the nasal brushings. In some patients we had, but in most patients there was either the sputum or either the other uh, analysis, which is, uh, well, we can't change it anymore, but it's we would have, we could, should have designed it better. We did a gene set variation analysis on these data. And what is gene set variation? It is an analysis for transcriptomics you use in heterogeneous diseases. We knew, and we know asthma is heterogeneous, and it is quite strong in these groups. And what does it do? For all these patients, so for sample one, two, four, et cetera, we uh, had all the genes, the expression of the genes, and we knew from literature that some group of genes or gene sets um, were as associated with certain um, certain things, such as eosinophilia, such as TH2 or T2 inflammation, the different treatments they had, um, or bleomycin induced um, um, airway um, remodeling in, in urine models. So we had 105 predefined gene signatures. The title of your bioprint is unbiased. This is a semi-biased analysis, you should remember, because we didn't have an open look to it. 105 predefined gene signatures. And from all of these gene signatures, we calculate an enrichment score, which is a combination of the expression of all these genes in one of these signatures. So for each patient, we had 105 enrichment scores. We compared enrichment score between the groups, patients with persistent airflow limitation uh, versus patients without airflow limitation. And we used a generalized linear model. Uh, we covariated for smoking, for prednisone use, and for years of asthma diagnose. And I'll show you later why, because this was different between the group. And we said if the uh, groups had a different enrichment score of 0 0.2, an enrichment score can, uh, can go from minus one to plus one. So 0 0.2 was, if the difference was a minimum of 0 0.2 and the p-value was smaller than 0 0.05, we would call this gene signature significantly different between the groups. This research is good to emphasize is hypothesizing generating research because we want to see to what, what patterns were there in these patients. If you look at all patients in uh, your biopreds, there were uh, in severe asthma patients um, with included smokers, 197 did not have persistent airflow limitation and 224 had, so a little bit more than half. Um, with persistent airflow limitation were significantly, uh, statistically significant older, but I don't think clinical because there were 49 and 54. Um, they had a significant longer duration of disease, that's why we uh, use it as a covariate. Interestingly, which may be very uh, interesting, the pack years number did not, was not different between the groups. So it, do, it does not seem to be a smoking related effect. The post bronchodilator um, uh, number was significant higher per definition in the no persistent effort limitation. 
sputum eosinophils, <laughs> blood eosinophils was higher in persistent every limitation, and the sputum eosinophils was higher as well, 1.2% versus 4.8%. I go to some of the results. So these are the plots you get. Um, these are the patients. This was a gene signature associated with IL-13. We found in nasal brushing to be significantly different in patients with airflow limitation as compared to patients without. As you appreciate, which is much more often than Manali, and you can all tell me much more often than this kind of uh, analysis, it is very heterogeneous, the result. Um, and you have to look at the patient as well per patient. But we saw the difference. If we looked at EOS, we saw especially a subgroup here, which was much more higher in sputum. The signal was much more higher in patients with persistent airflow limitation. And we saw that an uh, uh, interferon uh, alpha, I didn't put the right thing, was significantly lower in patients with persistent airflow limitation. These were the results summarized. In the nasal brush, we saw the IL-13 signature to be higher in persistent airflow limitation. We saw in sputum the uh, eosinophil signature to be higher in persistent effort limitation. We saw the INF, IF, IFN alpha signature to be lower in sputum. And we saw a bleum sign induced signature to be lower in sputum and higher in bronchial biopsies. I can't really explain it. It may have to do with the uh, suboptimal overlap of samples. And we saw there were two signatures, or there was a signature associated with patients who had fluticus on treatment, which was higher in bronchial brush and bronchial biopsies as well, which may have to do, to do that these patients were more severe or more, um, um, more severe, more treatment. Um, so we know that persistent airflow, this showed us as well, persistent airflow limitation in severe asthma is accompanied with a distinctive underlying pathways. These pathways may direct the development of targeted treatments in severe asthma. Uh, and we found, I put it wrong again. No, I have an alpha and uh, IL-13. Well, IL-13, I've learned a lot about past months and about the mucus. I wasn't very, um, not as aware of as I, as I know, which may have to do with the persistent after limitation that the IL-13 pathway uh, causes mucus. And this is the reason patients keep being obstructed. I have an alpha may have to do that we know that Ivan alpha is uh, associated with eosinophilic airway inflammation. So this may have to do, it is associated with airway hyperresponsiveness. And we also know from a more recent study, it is a, a predictor for bronchial thermopathy uh, outcome. Uh, and we also may know that it has a role in viral infection. So you may hypothesize that a lower Ivan alpha may, um, um, may patients with the, this may have an impaired um, uh, viral infection defense mechanism, which may cause more severe disease. A similar analysis we did in patients with her, which had her adult onset versus childhood onset severe asthma. I won't go over the methods again, because they're the same. We did gene set variation analysis in a subgroup of patients with severe asthma, including smokers. Uh, and we did a gene set variation analysis. And I'll go, this is, I think it's interesting. The eosinophil signature was higher in patients with adult onset severe asthma, which may not uh, surprise us either because we see them have more eosinophilic disease in our clinics as well, in the bronchial brush. Um, and there was a mast cell signature, and I'll go a little, little bit deeper on this as well, because I think that's interesting as well to discuss later on. Uh, uh, both in sputum and in bronchial brush, we saw the mast cell signature was significant higher in patients with adult onset asthma, both in sputum and bronchial brush. But even especially you see in the, in the um, uh, sputum sample that there is a subgroup of patients with a really high uh, mast cell signature. There's a group with adult onset asthma who don't, who don't and a group who does. So what we, first to summarize the, the, uh, the older results, uh, we found, as I said, the mast cell signature to be significant higher in sputum. We found the eosinophil signature to be significant higher in uh, child and adult onset asthma and the mast cell signature here as well. There were two signatures who are, um, who tended to be significant different, that's why they're orange which were higher, the TH2 high signature and the IL-13 signature to be higher in patients with adult onset asthma as well. 
So we wanted to look only at the patients with adult onset severe asthma. And we divided them the mast cell high signature versus the mast cell low signature. And we just had a look at these patients. So these are all patients with severe adult onset severe asthma. The mast cell gene signature that were used consisted of these six genes. They were, um, they were uh, um, published in 2017. So just at the moment, this was published as well. And if we compare these patients, which is quite interesting, I think, we see that they were all having adult onset asthma. However, age of onset was higher in patients with a mast cell signature and the duration was shorter. So they had a higher, uh, uh, they were older when they got it and they had a shorter disease, a shorter duration of disease. Interesting, the A2P did not differ between the groups. So you may not think it is all A2P driven. Um, and sputum ease fields were significantly higher in patients with a mast cell signature, 1.2% versus the 20.7%. This is, I plotted here the, the figures for the, um, for the mast cells, as you can see, these are the patients with the sputum eosinophils in the uh, without or the mast cell signature, which is low, and this is the mast cell signature high. So there are some with no eosinophils, but most of them have uh, sputum eosinophils, as this is the percentage in sputum. So it is quite high, most of them. So what we concluded is that <clears throat> patients with adult onset asthma who had a mast cell signature or, or may have mast cell involvement at later onset of disease, had more eosinophilic airway inflammation. And I think interestingly, ATP was comparable within this, within, within this group. It isn't all uh, allergy driven. So to conclude my whole talk, I talked a little bit about the prevalence of severe asthma. I showed you one slide about the work on comorbidities we did. Um, and I showed you two of the studies we did on to look how can we um, uh, find detect mechanisms associated with severe asthma. But it's important to look at the future as well. Well, Hans had a great look into the future. And just a small part of that is the, uh, in my views of registry. So here is the figure I showed you before. And I think uh, epidemiology is part of looking at severe asthma. Systems biology is looking at severe asthma. And I think you, <coughs> sorry, I think you can all collect this in a registry by repeatedly collecting data, including questionnaires, including demographic data, including data on exacerbations, but also data on biomarkers, blood, pheno, sputum, which we don't always do now, or most of the times don't do, which can guide us to give a, a better, um, well, more targeted treatment, and we can go to systems medicine, what we call it. So during my research, I was involved in, um, um, in uh, produ no, not producing, in um, making the Rhapsody Registry, which is a Dutch registry for severe asthma patients. It was the blueprint for the SHARP, which is a European uh, um, severe asthma registry. We started with three hospitals, Amsterdam, where I was working, Rotterdam, hospital I'm working now, and Leeuwarden, the hospital of Anneke ten Winken. And currently we have more than a thousand patients included, over 20 hospitals from the Netherlands. What they do, they have a yearly hospital visit, we collect data on the demographics, um, exacerbations, questionnaires, also lung function, pheno, um, blood, um, spirometry. And every three months they get an, they have an app they get, they are asked to fill the ACQ and the AQ, AQLQ and the St. George uh, respiratory uh, questionnaire. So with this, I want to end my talk. Um, I think <clears throat> I've learned a lot about severe asthma during the uh, years of research. And I think it all comes together with being here. So I'm very thankful and grateful for being here as well. Um, um, because I really do believe as compared to when I did my research, which was between 2014 and 2018, and now it's only been four years, but there has been many, many big steps in the treatment and the knowledge about uh, severe asthma, which is, partly due to the Dubai Fred, but most partly due to all the work which is done here as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Thank you very much, Steph, for sharing with us that you, Biopred, for those of you not aware, 
new bioproject, in my opinion, is the best um, data set and mechanistic study ever, way better than the severe asthma registry program in the United States. This has given us so much clinical insight into, into the practice. And for my own, there are three big take home from the U-Biofront that I've learned. If you don't know if Roma Semi is online, but Roma started a program here on ILC2 biology and a lot of our research on ILC2 was driven from the information we got from uh, U-Biofront. The second very, very important aspect of this is the IL-13 signature. And, um, and the mucus that we have followed up on. And I started the mast cell, but we'll discuss that later. I've got slightly different interpretation of mast cell biology than what uh, this data shows, because you've got a subsequent paper recently published from Fan Chan, which we'll talk about. Um, anything, any questions? We'll start with, and by, by the way, again, this Peter's paper that 2014, Jackie in practice, that figure that he showed, is one of the most displayed figures of all in asthma. So the Halder analysis is probably the most shown. And uh, it's got major problems. It's a snapshot. It doesn't show stability of a phenotype over time, but yet it's, but Peter's paper is shown everywhere. So I knew that figure before I knew Peter. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of repeat the question. So you stand uh, uh, You stand a bit back so people can see you because our camera is not. Yeah. So I just want to talk about um, you know, allergies. You, you didn't mention any of the sort of sensitivity allergens or not this group. And um, ATP is the same between the groups, but, but you know, ATP is not the same as sensitivity allergens. allergens for and so many of these signatures are, you know, T2 type signatures. Um, I remember Freddie, Freddie used to sort of set his watch by the green or the orbit. Is that right? Right? <laughs> I know his watch. It was, he had an old watch, yeah. <laughs> he had an old watch, yeah. But so, so the recognition of things like um, fungal allergens, et cetera, things that are not necessarily picked up uh, in the cultivation test, et cetera. Uh, might be playing a role in all of this. Um, do you have any thoughts? Well, I totally agree because I believe um, um, so. That's the, diff the the good and the bad thing about these studies. As I said, they are hypothesizing generating. So, and you really have to look into the data and into the patient and um, uh, compare it to the groups because this was a subgroup analysis, as you can appreciate. So. Um, I don't have the data. I, don't, I didn't look at the specific um, uh, sensitizing allergens, for example. But I certainly believe this can play a role in these patients. And we see these patients as well in Holland, and I've seen them with the clinic with Dr. Muir as well. Like patients uh, which are had an elephant's of asthma, and they're quite severe. Um, and I think this study, which, so the, the data I, the analysis I did in 2017, sorry, I have to stand here. Um, uh, I have to, I'm still looking at you. <laughs> um, are really, can really underline the thoughts or can give us um, food for the next step to do these analysis and indeed look at different uh, uh, sensitizing allergens. So I really think this can help us making the next step. But, I didn't. I didn't do the analysis on the typical sensitizing allergens. So, so just to follow up to that, actually, just to repeat the question for the audience, uh, Mark Lasher is commenting on the relationship between specific allergens and allergies, just not sensitization. It's a point he was making, and how this relate the analysis relates to um, allergy. So, can I just say that a little further? So, a few years ago, Aram and I co-supervised um, a master's student who. Uh, was we looked at blood responses to a very wide variety of um, fungal allergens, fungus and smuts. And bacteria. And, and bacteria. And um, the, you know, the, the, the problem with looking for sensitizing allergens is that there are potentially thousands of them. And of course, any pattern of skin test panel is about 20 can do that. But it's still that is about perhaps it's there, it's, uh, it's about, you know, if you can't, if you're not looking for something, you don't find yeah. them, it's just a big hole in your knowledge, uh, which I think is, you know, potentially a problem in some of these patients, because you, you just never know that they're environmental. Yeah. 
Just to repeat the question, a comment again, Mark was commenting that sensitization is IG mediated and we're only limit, testing a limited panel. There could be other mechanisms by which a particular allergen or bacterial fungus could drive an inflammatory response. By, and what he had demonstrated, a student demonstrated, is that he could directly stimulate T lymphocytes to drive an IL-5 ruin process. It may not really be an IG mediated process. Uh, one has to be more careful um, relating uh, allergy sensitized or an allergen or is something that you're exposed to a biological response. Yeah, other? yeah Jay. Um, there, in the new bio brand, we can describe all the different types of samples that were taken, amazing brush, bronchial brush, lapses, and, and so on. Um, but, um, is there the opportunity, and I'm kind of nervous with talks, or sort of a future state versus a you know, current state, where where maybe something like a nasal blast, which we've all become very accustomed to over the last couple of years, yeah. could be used in a distributed model and use it. You know, you're talking about students and you know, and you can kind of watch and help someone respond to therapy. Is there the opportunity to at least has anyone in you by talking about nasal brushes and and is there a signature that it may be treatable in the nasal brush that can be monitored remotely and be helpful? Maybe even, I think, really quantitatively with RTPTR or sequencing, but even lateral flow, which we've all become used to. Is there any conversation about moving towards distributing these types of signatures and monitoring these signatures in the community? Yeah, I, it would be very interesting. And I think I generally believe we first have to understand what is happening in this patient and how it works. And you're looking for a biomarker, right? And easy to use biomarker at home. Um, um, but in, I believe in order to have a good at home biomarker, which really can help us further, further we need to understand uh, what is happening. And if you know what is happening, then you can measure. And if you're just measuring and you see some signal, you may try to use it to uh, guide therapy, for example. Um, I'm not sure if that's the way to go. Your biopred study was 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 designed. It says you're unbiased to first have a look to identify these signals, and they may they use these results for different studies to be designed to, for example, look in the nasal brush whether we can use it as a biomarker to um, to identify identify certain patients with this and this uh, characteristics or this and this uh, underlying mechanism, which may have a beneficial effect from this and this treatment. Um, so I certainly believe that um, the data is there, but the original design and what it is used for is just have a broad look, have a large patient group, have different uh, novel uh, statistical techniques just to look what is happening. And that's what we try to do here as well. Obviously, what I showed as well, the last we tried to, to look at these patients as well, what is happening. Uh, but I, I believe if you really would want to uh, develop or uh, validate, validate uh, a biomarker, you would need a different design. Yeah, Jared, it's a very important point. There's a major drawback of a U-Biopret, which we need to consider. Now, nasal brushings would give you an insight into mechanisms. It might be a surrogate for something in the airway to understand mechanisms, but the major drawback of U-Biopret this U Biopred made no attempt to adjust treatment based on these signatures. Yeah. So you've got absolutely no information as to whether this information, when utilized to make clinical decisions, could lead to better outcomes. That was never the purpose of U Biopred. Yeah. So it has been heavily criticized that this has not made a huge impact in disease management. But it is not actually true. We have used this information heavily. And I'll comment later. There are no questions. We're running. We've got a few minutes. Uh, two instances where we have made utilize this information from you by Bioprit to advance our patient management. I'll come to that. Uh, but that's made the criticism. Yes, you can use it as a surrogate, what is in the nose. And the, one of the papers did compare and show distinct profile in children versus adults, right? I mean, the brushings showed a different message in children as opposed to the adults. Uh, but that's a criticism. You, we have no evidence whether this will translate to any therapeutic and I want to you into this, but whatever, what, you know, the point of care sort of biomarker, yeah. what about the uh, clinical monitoring? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have got, we have submitted one paper to Nature Chemistry, um, um, aiming high with the DNA design method of detecting EPX, John Brennan, 
And the second paper is with scientific reports, uh, then aptamer based. So we've got point of care working. Now we've got to test it in clinical practice. Any other questions? Yes, please go ahead. First of all, thank you for your excellent talk. Um, I realized that uh, all these patients in the very vibrant are only in a steroids, isn't it? And all these studies adult onset versus early onset are in a steroids, and adult onset high is the early onset yeah. uh, And it struck me just five minutes ago that uh, in the early 90s, virus studies and even industry student studies on patients, young patients, steroid naive. Were with high incidence in the areas. Isn't it uh, uh, the difference between early onset versus adult onset the response to uh, inhaled steroids? And might the muscle play a role in that? Um, this may be, however, if you saw the figure which we compared, this was a sub analysis, and both yep. patients were adult onset. So, in, the, in part of patients, this may be true. As I started with, it's a very heterogeneous yep. disease with different endotypes. So <clears throat> uh, I'm, I don't think we can conclude that this from the, the studies we've done that um, um, it is due to inhaled steroids because we both were on the same regimen of the steroids. They were comparable, the, the doses. So um, uh, you can't use that as a, as a biomarker, even though we saw that uh, patients with uh, uh, childhood onset asthma versus adult onset asthma um present a different signatures maybe they respond better on in a, in a steroid that's yeah. why they're uh, lower maybe right? but this is different in the in the subgroups as well okay. so part of the subgroup had low okay. eastern fields and sputum right. and part of the mast cell highs uh, group had high, high uh, eastern fields sputum numbers percentages so there's a comment here from roma semi so one of the the benefits that we derive from the UBiopra data set is a program that Roma is directing, is the studies into ILC2 biology. So UBiopra very conclusively showed from Guo's paper, ERJ, one of the most quoted of the UBiopra analysis, that the patients who have got a lot of eosinophils, most of them have an ILC2 signature, and Roma has been studying ILC2 biology. We've shown that prednisone dependent patients. The uh, predominant source of IL-5 is the ILC2 cells in the lung, and that's what the U biopsy showed. We picked up on that. Her comment is that she has also observed what you showed yeah. that the interferon alpha can inhibit ILC2 production, uh, 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 ILC2 secretion of IL-5 and proliferation and synthesis. Yeah. So it's consistent with that, and I think she's looking into that uh, further. Yeah. And she actually commented, she asked her to unmute and post a question itself, but she's having computer problems. She would like to discuss this with you in yeah, person. Course, yeah. I listen to. Uh, air, persistent airflow limitation. Another important thing to consider is what Sarah is considering, and you have yeah. seen this. In addition to mucus as a predominant contributor, I think airway dyssynapsis might be a contributor, which is an emerging field. Ben Smith at McGill is looking at that. Sarah, so do you want to comment on persistent airflow obstruction? In yeah, what, what Maybe, sorry. Do you have a microphone? Yeah, I don't have a microphone. Yeah, a microphone. But that yeah. won't protect too. Or... So we're, um, uh, I was very interested in some of the age you showed um, comparing the consistently low versus um, not consistently low. And what we're interested in looking at is applying the the two aspects that of persistent airflow obstruction in addition to smoking and prematurity at birth could be mucus plugging the airway and dyssynapsis, which is a broad term that encompasses uh, reduction airway number, branching morphogenesis, uh, and a number of other factors, and anatomy, fractals, all sorts of things that lead to airway anatomy. Any other questions in the chat? I don't know. No, I think that's about it. But finally, just one comment about the mast cells. The data that's our, what we think the U-Biopod has shown 
in the subsequent paper, you showed that the mast cell signature was highest in those with eosinophils. Mm -hmm. So they go hand in hand. It's very difficult to tease out what the contribution of the mast cell is over and above that of the eosinophils will both go up. So in what proportion of severe asthmatics is a severity primarily driven by mast cell? This is a clinically relevant question. And what this subsequent, the latest Fanchung's Ubiopred paper showed is that the mast cell signatures, whether in activated, un, you know, non-activated cells or activated by either IL-33 or interferon gamma, were not in the eosinophilic group, not in the so-called post-granulocytic group, but in the patients with mixed eosinophils and neutrophils. So that was a group that had the highest, which leads back to the old data from Barry Case labs that neutrophils can, you know, mast cell products can be a chemoattractant for neutrophils in some patients, a non-infective cause of neutrophil accumulation, which is what we are looking at. Um, Melanie is not here, she's joined remotely, is studying that for her masters. So that's something which we have picked up on and yeah. pursuing further. Yeah, Ma yeah. Mark? Jim, I just want to comment related to uh, mast cells. So uh, Alex Setti in uh, San Diego, uh, published uh, a couple of years ago a study on um, single cell RNC, uh, allergen specific T cells, uh, in house test mice, uh, sensitized asthmatic. Um, so, well, house, house test mice sensitized COVID uh, by polymers for this. And this, one of the strongest signals that came out of that was IL9. So, you know, the asthmatics had two cells of labor on IL9. Of course, IL9 is important to the region, important to our cell biology. So, I don't know whether IL9 is going to be in this. I mean, we didn't mm -hmm. show any G was. No, we didn't do it. No, yeah. no, not in this subgroup analysis, we didn't uh, do the G was. But the IL9 story is very interesting. You know that a um, number of companies, particularly Medimmune and AstraZeneca, had a long interest in targeting IL9. They did a clinical trial which did not meet the primary endpoint. It was published in Clinical Experimental Allergy. The study was poorly designed. They didn't enrich the population for those who could have potentially benefited. It's very sad, but the program died. We could have actually picked, I wrote to them multiple times to do a second study in the right population, but the decision had already been made. The molecule was killed, unfortunately. So IL-9 still remains unanswered whether targeting it would make a difference in a small subset of patients. But anyway. Thank you. I just wanted to add this project. No, I mean, if once a companies make a decision on this, it's market driven and they just have closed their program. But I have five that's right. Oh, yeah. I, uh, had it not been for Freddie's persistence, that would have been shelved as well. Yeah. Right. Anyway, thank you very much, Peter. And it's been a pleasure. And he's going to help us understand some very key questions. So before we, we might even um, uh, cancel a uh, sort of exit permit so that he can <laughs> stay here a bit longer <laughs> until he finishes this. We'll send his family back. But he'll stay here. <laughs> he'll come back. Oh, he has to go back. Right. Thank you very much Thank again. You very Thank much. you. Thank you very much.